Hi. Welcome to part 10 of the, uh, trying to make everything be blurred behind me. <laughs> uh, welcome to part 10 of the Doctrine of Repentance. And just to give you a idea of everything that we have comfort, that we have covered thus far. This is uh, from my um, notepad file that I had titled Chapter Headings. And um, we got Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3 complete. And the sections of Chapter 3 got Chapter 4 done, Nature of True Repentance. The... Um, Chapter 5 is, is the ingredient number 3, and then chapter 6, I believe, actually chapter 5 is the reasons. Um, let's see here, do I have that here? I have it, but it, I didn't write it out as such. Um, what I have as chapter 7 is actually chapter 5 in the book. But the reasons enforcing repentance, and as you can see, there are there are several specific parts to this chapter. But as many parts as there are, it's a short chapter. The track that I recorded for it is only 13 minutes. It's barely it's barely 14 minutes in length. So, I may actually do chapter 5 and part of chapter 6 in this, in this uh, recording. So, getting over to those screens. <laughs> this one and that one. This audio started. Chapter 5 The Reasons Enforcing Repentance With a Warning to the impenitent. I proceed next to the reasons which enforce repentance. Number one, God's sovereign command. He commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Repentance is not arbitrary. It is not left to our choice whether or not to repent. It is an indispensable command. God has enacted a law in the high court of heaven that no sinner will be saved except the repenting sinner, and God will not break his own law. Even if all the angels were to stand before God and beg for the life of an unrepenting person, God would not grant it. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, keeping mercy for thousands, will by no means clear the guilty. From Exodus chapter 34, verse 67. Though God is more full of mercy than the sun is full of light, yet he will not forgive a sinner while he continues in his guilt. He will by no means clear the guilty. Number two. The pure nature of God denies communion with an 
impenitent creature. Till the sinner repents, God and he will not be friends. Wash, make yourself clean, from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Go, steep yourself in the brinish waters of repentance. Then, says God, I will parley with you. Come now and let us reason together. From Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. But otherwise, do not come near me. What communion has light with darkness? From 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. How can, some, how can the righteous God indulge someone who still goes on in his trespasses? I will not justify the wicked. From Exodus chapter 23, verse 7. If God were to be at peace with a sinner before he repents, God would seem to like and approve all that he has done. He would go against his own holiness. It is inconsistent with the sanctity of God's nature to pardon a sinner while he is still in the act of rebellion. Number three, sinners continuing in impenitence are out of Christ's commission. See his commission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. From Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. Christ is a prince and savior, but not to save men in an absolute way, whether or not they repent. If ever Christ brings men to heaven, it will be through the gates of hell. God has exalted him to be a prince and a savior to give repentance. From Acts chapter 5, verse 31. A king pardons rebels if they repent and yield themselves to the mercy of their prince, but not if they persist in open defiance. Number four, we have wronged God by sin. There is a great deal of equity in requiring that we repent. By sin, we have wronged God. We have eclipsed his honor. We have infringed his law. And we should reasonably make reparation. By repentance, we humble and judge ourselves judge ourselves for sin. We stamp our seal that God is righteous if he were to Excuse me. We stamp our seal that God is righteous if he were to destroy us. Thus, we give glory to God, and we do what lies in us to do in order to repair his honor. Number five. If God saves men without repentance, without discriminating, then he must save all. Not only men, but devils as origin once held. And so consequently, the decrees of election and reprobation must fall to the ground. Let all judge how diametrically opposed this is to sacred writ or sacred writings. There are two sorts of persons who will find it harder to repent than others. The first kind those who have set, sat a great while under the ministry of God's ordinances, but grow no better. The earth, which drinks in the rain and yet bears thorns and briars, is near to being cursed. From Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. There is little hope of the metal, which is lain long in the fire, but is not melted and refined. When God has sent his ministers, one after another, exhorting and persuading men to leave their sins, 
but they settle upon the dregs of formality, and they can sit and sleep under a sermon, it will be hard for those to ever be brought to repentance. They may fear that Christ will say to them, as he once said to the fig tree, let no fruit grow on you forevermore. From Matthew chapter 21, verse 19. The second type. Those who have sinned frequently against the convictions of the word, the checks of conscience, and the motions of the spirit. Conscience has stood as the angel with a flaming sword in its hand. It has said, do not do this great evil. But sinners do not regard the voice of conscience. They march on resolvedly under the devil's colors. These will not find it easy to repent. They are those that rebel against the light. From, I, from Job chapter 74, verse 13. It is one thing to sin for lack of light, and another to and, a, and another thing to sin against light. The unpardonable sin begins here. Men begin by sinning against the light of conscience, and then proceed gradually to spite the spirit of grace. A reprehension to the impenitent. Firstly, it serves to sharply reprimand all unrepenting sinners whose hearts seem to be hewn out of rock or carved and are like the stony ground in the parable which lacked moisture. This disease, I fear, is epidemic. No man repented of his wickedness. From Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 6. Men's hearts are marbled into hardness. They made their hearts like an adamant stone. From Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12. They are not at all dissolved into a penitent attitude. It is believed by some that witches never weep. I am sure that those who have no grief for sin are spiritually bewitched by Satan. We read that when Christ came to Jerusalem, he upbraided the cities because they did not repent. From Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. And may he not likewise upbraid, those, upbraid many now for their impenitence? The word upbraid is find fault with someone or scold them. And may he not likewise scold or criticize many now for their impenitence. Though God's heart is broken with their sins, yet their hearts are not broken. They say, as Israel did, I have loved strangers and I will go after them. From Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 25. The justice of God, like the angel, stands with a drawn sword in his hand, ready to strike but sinners do not have eyes as good as those of Balaam's ass to see the sword. God pounds on men's backs, but they do not, as Ephraim did, pound on their thigh. From Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 19, which reads, Surely, after my turning, I repented, and after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach of my own youth. It was a sad complaint the prophet took up. You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. From Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3. That is surely 
reprobate slip that is surely reprobate silver which hardens in the furnace. In the time of his distress he trespassed still more against the Lord. This is that King Ahaz from Second Chronicles chapter twenty eight verse twenty two. A hard heart is a receptacle for Satan. Just as God has two places he dwells in, heaven and a humble heart, so the devil has two places he dwells in, hell and a hard heart. It is not falling into water that drowns, but lying in it. It is not falling into sin that damns, but lying in it without repentance, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Hardness of heart results at last in the conscience being seared. Men have silenced their consciences, and God has seared them. And now, as a father gives up correcting a child whom he intends to disinherit, God lets them sin and does not punish. Why should you be stricken anymore? From Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5. End of chapter 5. Before I continue on that, I did want to point out several sections. This part right here. And we should reasonably make reparation. By repentance, we humble and judge ourselves for sin. That section right there. In the process of being taught about repentance, and I have the book somewhere. Be right back. Looks like this. And I'll, get, I'll, I'll get back to it um, with the background un, unblurred so you can see the, the book. But that book, when I was learning that book, the most interesting part for me was the fairness of judgment. The number one thing that very many people don't recognize as really all that important is that if they are guilty of doing a thing, then they would be judged for the, they would be judged and there would be a consequence for it. The writer, Natasha, makes a most startling comment. She says, and she may not, may not, it may not be in this book, but it would be in a lot of her teaching. She says, what would be the most tricky, as in to trick and um, mislead, what would be the most misleading statement that Satan could ever get a unbeliever to believe in regards to consequences to such a degree that it would literally damn them from being able to repent. What do you suppose that one thing would be? Check this out. The number one lie that the enemy gives to every person in hopes that they will believe. Because if they believe this one thing, it makes his job a whole lot easier. You ready? Here's the lie. You won't have to be judged for your things until you die. That 
is the number one lie that the enemy gives to all people in hopes that they will believe him. And we can see that this is actually not God's design. Yes, there is a great white judgment. Yes, there is a throne. Yes, there is a point at which you're going to be judged for the things you did according to what you should have been doing. Yes, that is all true. But that is not God's actual design. God's actual design is that when you do a thing, there is an instantaneous judgment and an instantaneous consequence. For example, Lucifer was in the temple. He was the anointed cherub. He did all these different things. And yet, the moment that iniquity was found in his heart, his ability to be that anointed cherub was instantly lost. Now, the consequence of hell is coming for him. But the mercy of God for the rest of creation is delaying his end of time consequence. So in order for the consequence to truly be felt, he would have to know that he wouldn't have any type of sway. It didn't matter what he did, he wouldn't be able to sway any type of human away from God. Except... Except that God, in his mercy, allows humans the ability to choose whether they want to go after the things of God or if they want to do the things of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whether they want to go after the tree of life and keep the spiritual connection open, or whether they want to go after the tree of knowledge of good and evil and keep the and for and keep themselves banished from having the authority of God. God gives every person that choice: walk by the spirit or walk by knowledge. Spirit brings life, knowledge brings death. And so when we choose knowledge, there is a consequence of death. And that is fair. And then we get into what the devil hates. And we get into, into the number one thing that has Satan and all of his hordes hating all of humanity, whether or not humanity even recognizes they have this ability, he still hates them because they represent something that he can't do. That thing? He can't repent. He cannot change away from his consequence. His consequence is already set, but the ability for the human is that the human has the opportunity up until the point where God just takes them out of the light, out of uh, this earth, but they have up until that moment to repent, to confess, and believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and Master, and they will serve Him for all of his, all of their days, even if all of their days is just a few minutes because it's a bedside confession. He still allows bedside confessions. This is why Satan hates all humans. So, in order to keep them, keep as many humans as possible, in order to keep them from understanding what their role is in all of 
the world, Satan tells them this lie. You will not immediately get judged for anything that you do. That's a big lie. Because he is proof <laughs> that that is a lie. He had iniquity in his heart and boom! Kicked out of heaven. We have iniquity of generations. And while the authority is forbidden to us, the ability to exist and seemingly without consequence of sin, that whole bit of seemingly therein is the lie of the enemy. The enemy, Satan, will tell all humans and all who will listen, you're not going to be judged until the end. That is why this book is so powerful. This book found on uh, Amazon, you can get it in bit, almost every country, except maybe China or Japan, and maybe parts of the Middle East, but you can get this book, and this book is going to drastically reset things in your life and in your bloodline to the point that you begin to understand that you can be judged for your things here and now. And while you are on the earth, you have the ability to answer your accuser in court, agreeing to being guilty every time. And it gets to the point where the accuser doesn't have anything else to accuse you of. There are not infinite things to be accused of. There is, a, there is a select number of things to be accused of. And when you get to the select number and you have agreed to being guilty of every single one of them every time, and the enemy continues to accuse you of things that are now under the blood, now you can demand recompense. But only if you have agreed to being guilty of everything, that's the only way. That's the only way to get to the part of life where every time the enemy accuses you of something, he loses territory. That is the purpose of repenting for your bloodline. Now, that is a revelation that Mr. Watson didn't have when he wrote his book. But, it is a revelation that you can walk in if you choose to. I'm not here to tell you that this is the absolute right way to do it and you have to do it. No, not, not even going to try that. But, if you do, there is such a level of authority that is not realized. And the moment that you do realize it, it will change everything. All right? So that's, that's the first part that I wanted to show you. The second part... Is this right here? Matthew 21, 19. Let no fruit grow on you forevermore. That right there is a, is a section where he was talking about 
the Levitical priesthood being removed from being the priests. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve recognized that they were naked, and what did they cover themselves with? A fig tree, the leaves of a fig tree. If we go looking for leaves of a fig tree, they are pretty, you know, they're not just little tiny leaves, they're actually fairly sizable. Here we have a person next to, and you can begin to see, for an example of one type of, one type of, uh, oh, come on, one type of fig, you can begin to see that being covered up with a fig tree leaf, you know, it, it, might, it might cover some stuff. But the problem is not the fig tree. The problem is that it was the first system. And that first system was where one person would go in for the entire nation. That was the old system. In the new system, every person can go in for themselves because Jesus has paid the penalty of where sin would kill you if you stepped into the Holy of Holies and you had some type of sin in your life. You'd instant, instantly be dead. But the authority that you are seeking to have authority over old habits, over old addictions, over all those things that just hold you back. The authority to be free and clear of those parts can only come if you don't look like the sin that you're repenting of. Strange but true, that is the, that is what keeps you from having authority. You won't have authority over any of your addictions or old habits until you no longer look like them. And for very, very many people, the ability to not look like them means that you have a decree of divorce from them. And yes, I will continue to talk about this because this is literally what changed my life and hundreds of other people as well. Why do you say hundreds? Because this thing of bloodline repentance in the depth that Natasha teaches is only 41 years old. The Bible itself is to, is seven thousand, almost nearly nearly seven thousand years old. You've got got just the forty one years. How do you know? Well, just some things that she shared in her ministry, and I did, ran some numbers, and I realized my life age is very very close, almost to the day of when she started getting the information about repenting for the bloodline and how repenting for the bloodline gets you a level of authority that Satan most definitely does not want you to have. Now, while I did not have a timer running, <laughs> I did keep track of the time of when I started. And I started at about 11.55. It is... 
not quite 40 minutes forward so we're going to not we're not going to go as a, another chapter uh, besides this but um, chapter six which is a, a serious exhortation to repentance is not halfway through the book. The halfway point is when we get to chapter eight, and that will be the halfway point. Now, the reason I know this is because I've read through it. Chapter eight is actually the halfway because chapter eight is a really long chapter. But until we get there, I thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time for part 11 of the book, The Doctrine of Repentance. Bye now.